So our next uh, speaker is Esther Ama, and I give you a profile of Esther. So Esther A. Ama is a former international award-winning journalist, a media lecturer, and an author and playwright. She is a CEO of the Ama Institute of Emotional Justice, an international institute creating racial healing resources. It is based in Accra and works across Ghana, New York, and London. She is the author of Emotional Justice, a roadmap for racial healing, a number, a number one new release on Amazon in the category General Sociology of Race Relations for six straight weeks. As a journalist, she has worked in London, New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa. Esther is a columnist for Business and Financial Times and hosted the show The Spain that aired in Ghana, Nigeria, London, and the U.S. Esther, it is your turn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so good morning. <laughs> I would like to present this in two specific parts. The first part is called The Market and the Model. The second part will be called The Reality of Narrative, the Illusion of Information. So let's start with part one, the market and the model. We've heard different presentations and looking specifically at how the model of our media in Ghana is one that gains its profit from ad revenue. That model has not changed despite the market fundamentally transforming. So what does that mean? It means that you've had a market that is a monopoly, that is now filled with entrepreneurs, but the entrepreneurs are being treated as if they're multinationals. That recipe is a recipe for the kind of disaster that damages quality and it makes profitability almost impossible. The model has not changed, despite the democratization of the airways, thinking particularly about broadcast media. But the market has expanded powerfully. When we think about going from television and radio and print to the entire digitization of the media market, we're talking about how a market has trans transformed. So what does that mean and how does that manifest for where we are today? So there's two particular areas, power and change. The model of our media, particularly when it comes to broadcast, has been very much about the protection of power in a few select hands and the maintenance of that power, no matter what is happening in the market. It is a model that is resistant to change. To break it down all the way down, what does that look like? It means that you have a select few, often politically partisan, who, are, who treat power like a wife, and they treat change like a side chick. What do I mean by that? What is, what is the, who is the wife? If we think about it in Ghanaian terms, the commitment, the focus, where your, the majority of your resources goes, the thing that is protected, the person that is protected, who is the side chick? You go there occasionally, you dabble. If there's too much trouble, you don't stay, you leave. So what that means is there is no ongoing commitment to change, despite the fact that the market has exploded and there are players in there who could never have entertained that space at the point at which it was a monopoly. That means two things. The market requires a resource, and the resource is journalist. So I speak to you as somebody who was um, a journalist, who has been a media lecturer in the Ghanaian landscape, who has practiced in the newsrooms of multiple radio stations and has written for different publications. I give you that information as specific context for what I'm saying. The report speaks about um, the skills of journalists right. and the lack of them. The challenge that we have in this country is we're often over-certified but under-skilled. 
Journalism is an industry that, requ that requires practical application in order to test your skill set. If you, you may be able to present a beautiful paper if I give you two weeks. Can you present a quality story if I give you two hours? The practical reality of the market of journalism as it relates to its currency, which is the actual journalist, we're talking about the working market, requires an elevating skill set that is absent in the model that we have. Because if the, if the model requires that ad revenue is your primary source of profitability, but we know from the report that journalists are paid very, very badly, then who in this sector is making any money? Who? That is a very important question that we have to ask. That's the first question. The second question is then, if journalists are not making money, what is the currency of the model? And the currency of this model is about power. And how that power can persuade, motivate, transform, and engage. The fact that the ownership um, in the model sits in politically partisan hands is about controlling how power moves when it comes to information. What does that transform into? So you have um, unskilled labor in an industry that requires skills to perform at the highest level. So I want you to hear what I'm saying, that I'm speaking from the experience of both being on the mic, dealing with the challenges, um, training journalists who are coming into the industry, moving up the levels, towards the high levels in terms of being able to explore and understand ownership and how it works. So part of what happens is, when I think about the market of journalists, the training that is required to become a journalist is woefully inadequate. Um, I have taught journalism all over the world. I am a practitioner, but I do not have a, a doctoral degree. I do not have a PhD. I do not have a master's. That is not my experience. I have worked in multiple markets, and I have experience at the highest level. The first time I was ever challenged to teach was in Ghana. The very first time. Over-certified, but under-skilled. They required my certification, but they were not willing to acknowledge my skill set. That's one part. What does it mean if your industry is a respecter of certification and a negator of your skills? It creates this environment where people pursue the certification, but they're not paying attention to what the skills looks like. That's the first. The second thing, how does power manifest in, within this space? When the power is being controlled in order to maintain influence, how does that show up within the industry? Well, we've already said and heard, and the report has revealed that journalists are woefully underpaid. Mm. So that means those who choose to stay are demonstrating a commitment to a profession that is not reciprocating that commitment. That is unprofessional, it is unacceptable, it is unsustainable, and we should be outraged at a media that expects so much of those who contribute to it, but gives them so little to even sustain themselves. Then it has the nerve to talk about, well, then you're open to be influenced by um, players who are not dealing in integrity, but want to buy your influence on the mic. You have set up a model that's designed to penalize the very people you refuse to adequately compensate to do the job that they're being paid to do. That's the first part. The second part is the idea of treating power as the wife and change as, as the side chick sets up a model. Our previous spoke, speaker spoke about the poverty in adequate regulation and how the absence of adequate regulation is showing up in the, um, the future of the industry. When I went through the um, report, one of the things that's, that stood out to me is 112 pages long. Mm. As somebody who is a former um, media lecturer, my first thought is I would want to disseminate that report to every single communication student in this country. And I would require you to do assignments based on the key themes. Why? Because students do not understand the landscape of the media. 
They have no idea about the business model of the media. And we are in a moment where what is defined as power has to do with the numbers that you can manufacture without a necessarily verifiable source. And that is the reality that we're in. If you treat change like the side chick and you invest in power like the wife, you create the environment in which we're consistently navigating and resisting. And I say now that I speak as a former journalist because I now lead an organization that is specifically about healing and creating healing resources, but using journalistic tools. Why does that matter? Power and change. We have emerged from a global pandemic. And the global pandemic of COVID-19 devastated global economies. And yet, we are speaking about the media as if it too was not devastated by the reality of the pandemic, and therefore is ripe for the kind of change we might not otherwise have considered. But at this moment, it absolutely is possible on the basis of the disaster from which we have barely escaped with our lives and honoring the loss of life, the loss of security, the isolation, all the different economic devastation. So you have the economy of health of the nation, but the economy of the health of the media. Those are two crucial areas that intersect. But you also have the emotional economy of the journalists who are required to show up and contribute to creating content for people's consumption. As long as the model that we have maintains a reality that seeks to protect the power of the few, we will have cyclical arguments about who regulates what and the power or the absence of power of those regulatory bodies. Are we willing to reckon with the nature of how power is both protected for the privilege, it, for the privileged, in order to shape the perspective of the electorate, to shape the perspective of the public? Are we willing to wrestle with the fact that there are people who profit from the protection of that power, and so they're incentivized to keep the model exactly as it is? Are we willing to wrestle with the dynamic that we sustain by our inaction, even as we complain of the conditions under which we work if we're in the media, or the conditions that we engage when we either listen to the media, watch the TV, or read the content? We know that in Ghana, the numbers reveal that we are listeners of radio. We really love our radio. And the radio is one of the most powerful tools of development that I would argue is underused. Last point on this power, um, on, on this market versus model. Um, I want to talk about the market of safety. There is safety in unprotected power. The report talks specifically about the safety of journalists when they go out on the job. But I think that a crucial point was missed, and it highlights that males are at further risk of attacks than females. The issue of safety that must be included when we think about the status of Ghanaian media is the issue of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is an issue of safety for women within the media that shapes their ability to do their job, it shapes their safety on the job. It shapes their ability to move through the profession. But it also shapes the ideas of power for those who perpetrate the sexual harassment. And so I want to acknowledge, yes, the status um, of the Ghanaian media acknowledges sexual harassment. But what I'm arguing for is it must come under the title of safety in the workplace. You cannot think about a tax on the bodies of journalists when they go out into the um, public to do their jobs and not reckon with the safety of journalists when they're in the space where they then have to create their stories. And too often sexual harassment is normalized, it is trivialized, and it is minimalized. Hmm. And the result of that approach means that we do not consider it when we think about the idea of safety in the industry. And I would advocate that we must, part one. Let's talk about part two. The reality of narrative versus the illusion of information. What do I mean by that? 
The report talks about what is media. It's about information. What is information? Very simple. Information is the presentation of facts in order to help you understand a specific situation. What is narrative? Narrative is about shaping your understanding of a particular thing in order that I can influence you. Very quick example. This is information. We are currently sitting in a studio. Mm. There are three of us sitting at the desk. Two of us are women, one of us are men. Uh, one of us is a man. But there are two additional men in the studio who are standing behind the cameras. There's a camera, there is one camera in front of me, and then there are two monitors on my left. That is a set of facts that reveals to you what is in the studio. So to my presenter on the left, although is that set of information accurate? To my presenter on the right, is that set of information accurate? So what did I just do? I presented you a set of facts, and then the facts were verified by two sources, both of whom were next to me, who could say, because they were here, no, there are not five people in here, there's only two. <laughs> that is information. What is narrative? Narrative is, can you imagine, I walked into this studio, there was a bucket in the corner, the ceiling was dripping, the hole was there, the man was carrying a mop, as if the mop was a weapon. He came to beat this man on the right. And they want to try and tell you that this is a place where they do news. Joy, it's not true. What does that do? It shapes your understanding that this place is unserious, that it is dangerous, that it's unsafe, and that you cannot trust what is coming out of it. We are in the era of narrative as information. We are in the era where opinion is treated as research. And we are in an era where opinion and narrative is what constitutes news. Even though what we say is we want to offer you credible information, we want to offer you objectivity, those are things that in the evolution of the market has completely transformed. Digitization means 24-hour cable media means that in order to create content, the kinds of foundations that have been traditional to the practice of journalism have been abandoned. What do I mean? I'm an old school journalist. What that means is I am a researcher first and foremost. Research, research good research, is the fundamental backbone of quality journalism. Without research, you have nowhere to go. But the other part of journalism is challenge. And by that I mean you're asking questions. If my um, uh, a professor here on the left says to me, she gives me a version of information, and I say, but wait. Gentleman on the right said A, B, C, D. Madam, what is your response to what he said? I'm challenging your version of events. That's a crucial part of what, what um, constitutes good journalism. And yet, the nature of the market and the model means that political partisanship wants to protect the power of that person and not have their version of events challenged. What does that mean? It means that I am never presenting you with information that helps you simply understand a situation. It means that I am always offering you a narrative that is designed to influence how you think about a particular thing. And as long as that is the version of things that we are presenting, then it is a deficit model that we are passing off as an informational model. And in this day and age, that is unacceptable. It is also unprofessional and it is unjournalistic. Digitiz digitization has helped shape this era of the narrative. Why? Because 24-hour cable news means that people have access to information 24 hours a day. I have my phone in my bag, <laughs> laptops at the um, desk. The ability to check and engage and inform is constant. And yet, this is the contradiction we must face. We have the access to far more information than we have ever had, and yet the quality of what we offer is in freefall. We are dealing with less and less and less verifiable information, but more and more ways to actually verify the information. Part of the challenge is Ghana is part of a global media landscape 
where this is the reality. The era of the narrative is not unique to Ghana, it's not unique to the continent. I've worked in the US, I've worked in the UK, I've worked in media in other African countries. It is a global reality. But we are in Ghana, and we are talking about Ghanaian media. So the question is, what is our response going to be to this era of narrative that passes of information? We actually could treat it as a powerful opportunity to transform our landscape and create something of extraordinary quality that is specific to Ghana and the continent. The challenge that we have in our media landscape is two things. One, we want to protect the power of the privileged few who own the broadcast airwaves and have connections to the regulatory bodies mm. that keep us in free fall cycles of inactivity, inaction, stalling, all masquerading as policy. Yes, we have the um, policies. The practice is manifest in our organizational culture. So what is the thing that we can do? Recognize that our competition is not and has never been CNN. That we compare ourselves to things that make no sense for the market that we have. We are a nation that is in development. So what does that mean we could create? Let me give you some examples. Why don't we have local beats? By that I mean when I taught um, journalism, one of the schools I taught in was at Adabraka. We created a student radio station. If you went into the station, very, very basic tools, and the students would complain, I want this, I want that, I want the other. Why do you need all that? You, if you're in the village, can you use all those things? Mm. You cannot. So in Ghana, what I, I need to teach the students to use what they have, do what they can for the community that they are serving. So what does that mean? That our future is not trying to be some global, stratospheric, go to space kind of media. It is to look at the nation in which we live, 16 regions strong, and explore the power of community media and what the community needs in order that they are informed about what is happening in their specific area. And then that information enables them to make the kinds of decisions that transform their lives for the better. That is our work. That is our work. We're not doing it, and we could. What do I mean by beats? Just to come back to the school in Adabraka, I would make the students, um, they had a, some of them had a bad attitude to the workers outside from whom they would buy their small chops, their small, small things. And I would say to them, those workers are part of your community. So I want you to go out and interview them and find out who these people are. When they came back, the excitement on these students' faces, they said to uh, Miss E, they call me Miss E, my student. <laughs> Miss E, do you know there's a man on the corner, he sells newspapers. Do you know he sold newspapers for four different um, uh, government regimes? He knows the entire history of a regime. You can stand and talk to him for 30 minutes. Do you know that man who's selling you the newspaper that you just walked past is a historian? Just he is what? Not certified. So you don't want to respect his skill. Meanwhile, he's now coming to educate you about an area that you are in. So now when you move through this area of Adabraka, you have an understanding that you did not have before. Local community radio, local community media is the future that we do not think that we need. And yet it would be pivotal to transforming our industry in a way that is powerful. Last point I want to make as I close. We are an industry and a nation in need of a national healing. We cannot emerge from the disaster that is COVID and expect to go on to a policy or a reality as normal, as if we haven't been devastated. We are also a nation that is dealing with the legacy of colonialism that shows up in our relationship to power that centers the privilege and rejects the idea that the people do better when they are better informed of what is happening. We are a nation in need of a national healing. I call that national healing emotional justice. And I call it emotional justice because it's the kind of national healing that says, when I better understand the nature of what is happening in my community, I want to know why it is not my local kube that the kube seller sells that is being poured in glasses in hotels in Accra. I want to know why mine is a catch crop that is disrespected and treated as something for export 
Meanwhile, I can't actually send my kids to school. We are a nation that treats our mineral resource as a landscape of extraction. The national healing is about dealing with the legacy of colonialism, with the numbers of military coups that have transformed our relationship to governance, but most importantly, dealing with those two areas, the market and the model, and the reality of narrative, and the illusion of information. Let's do our work. Each of us has our part to do. And in doing that work, we actually hold the key to transforming our industry in a way that would serve the people as opposed to privilege the tiny powerful whose currency is influence over who you are and what you do in order that they never have to answer to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Esther. You, you. Your presentation could not have been any better. <laughs> and, but um, you have you heard the, the clapping behind? Yeah, I, I can. You can hear the sounds <laughs> hey, of the clapping. clapping. Yeah. Right. Wow. And I, I think you, you touch on very important, you know, the core, the, the substance of, of the problem or the core of a problem. And, and I believe I, I share a lot of views with you. Um, the question of being over-certified with limited skills and the rest, and sort of, you sort of um, subtly backlashed mm -hmm. <laughs> educational institutions, mm -hmm. I think is also a question of um, accreditation processes and the requirements for accreditation uh, for at the tertiary level, which um, is that for anybody to teach in the university, you have to be a PhD holder. Right. And so it's taking out those unless they're coming as maybe guest lecturers for a day or two but to bring industry people with wealth of experience into the classroom is a bit difficult mm -hmm. but elsewhere in fact recently i was in kenya and mm -hmm. this discussion came up right. in kenya for instance they have the professor of practice so somebody with extensive and they have a number of years of experience you should have you can come to the classroom, you are put at the professorial position right. and all of that. I think it's, it's, these are things we should also, as uh, educational institutions, be considering because mm -hmm. we also need yes. to look within ourselves. Yeah. I think that's a very important point. But I would also connect the point of about accreditation to the same argument about power and change. When you limit who is able to be in the classroom, you're limiting the opportunity for students to learn a different type of way. So the example that I gave, that this report for me was be an assignment for every communication student in this mm -hmm. country. Why? They do not understand their landscape. They don't know about the business model. They don't know the history of what, cre what created Ghana. But what I would also say is for, because it's, it's, it's produced in very much an academic style. Yes. So I would also say to students, I want you to turn 112 pages I want to see 15 different assignments. I want radio reports. I want you to create a podcast, create a short news story, create a news story where you could explain to your grandmother in the village the mm. entire content of this report in three minutes yeah. and 30 seconds. That's what I mean by unless the very crucial content is able to be de disseminated in ways that the people understand, it becomes something that is limited again exactly. to this very you know, market model it, narrative, mm -hmm. but not information. I must say we are also in our own small ways trying to transform as, and we, there is, you come to the Department of Communication Studies, you're doing quite well um, trying to, and, and that is why we do a lot of research also to understand right. what is happening in industry right. so that we can teach our students all the right, the right things that they need to. And it, it's not a critique of, because I take your point, and I think that's a fair point to make. It's more of a recognition that how will you change the market if, you, if you refuse to challenge the model? Mm. Mm. And that's what I mean. My challenge is an, is an important part mm. of media. And challenge is hard in a culture that sees challenge as a mark of disrespect. And so you have a culture that says, particularly for women, submission is your reward. But you have an industry that requires that you challenge in order to make change. So I definitely remember being a teacher, dealing with that in the classroom with my students and then them coming into the newsroom and facing backlash for doing that same kind of challenge. And yet, there's actually no way to grow unless you're able to do that. So I think, and then the beauty of the academy, because I'm a researcher at heart, the beauty of the academy is the focus on research. Mm. That you cannot come to present to the table and you didn't do your research. Right. Imagine. <laughs> And yet, that's what I mean by, but now opinion is masquerading mm -hmm. as research. Yes. And students want to literally present you with an opinion 
and challenge you about the fact that, okay, but what sources, where are your verifiable sources? So that brings into focus the media's role as a development agent. Yes. To Absolutely. also um, not project the stereotypes and as it were, deal with the narrative as if that was the information, so to speak. Yes, but they have right. to be, people have to be equipped to do that. So That's what right. happens is people blame mm. journalists for their failure to deliver mm. important information. But as somebody who's trained journalists, mm -hmm. they're failed at multiple levels by mm. multiple players. Right. But the ultimate failure is really about protecting the power. When mm. you don't pay anybody any money, to do a job that requires this amount of skill, then you guarantee that you get entry level people and you don't retain expertise. And particularly again, when it comes to women, there's too many instances where the, the model doesn't sustain how women's lives change. So mm -hmm. if they get married, if they have children, where instead of recognizing, you bring a whole nother set of wisdom to this thing called journalism, you're now treated as a, almost as a pariah. It becomes harder. Not that, of course, there are women who are wives and mothers in the, in the industry of media, but there's a way we have not allowed the structure to support the reality when they are 50% of the population. So this is what I mean by our model continues to do something that is unworkable. One last point I want to make about ad revenue. We are in a, actually an opportune moment to transform our industry if we're willing to do the work. Mm -hmm. The power of this report is it gives us a foundation. All the information is in one place if we would simply move forward and do the work. The last one I would make is the challenge with committees and more committees is honestly, it's where good ideas go to die mm -hmm. in Ghana. <laughs> that is our reality. All right. Thank you so very much, Esther Ama. Thank and um, we will take a quick break. We'll return to continue with the Joy Change Speakers Series 5 and you have just been your mind has just been blown and i'll read some of the messages that have come in right after her presentation over certified but under skilled we need an elevator skill set um, which is absent in the model practice in ghana journalists are not making as they could and she also delves into the problems with the ownership and how this all appears to be contrived to just keep to projecting that power.